Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Carrick Butler, the pastor of Faith Christian Center. Thanks for tuning in today. We believe today's message is going to help you live this lifestyle of faith. It's going to empower you to live a life that makes Jesus famous wherever you go. Open up your heart. We know God has something special just for you. And we believe that as you listen to today's message, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up. I'll talk to you today at the end of our broadcast. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 13, part 3 of our Air series. And we had a great Sunday. So if you're, we started our family series um, for the 9 11 30 experiences right here, and it was tremendous. We're picking up with part 2 this coming Sunday. And as I talk about the second word, the first word was expectations. So when we talk about the second word on Sunday, I have a panel of couples who are going to help me out as I share it. You know, we have a couple that's been married five years, a couple that's been married about 20 years, a couple that's married over 30 years, and then another couple married over 40 years. And they're going to help with that first part of the message. I know you guys are going to enjoy it, so don't miss this Sunday. And then also last Sunday, on Sunday night, we had our second Marietta experience. Amen. We had nine people make decisions for Jesus. And on top of that, even more people got filled with the Holy Ghost. So it was a tremendous experience, you know, hearing testimonies. And I got another testimony tonight. Uh, Brother Eric shared with me that there was a guy who walked in and he had, you know, we tried to shake his hand, but he had arthritis in his hand. So, you know, we're a church that believes Jesus heals, right? So Brother Eric prayed for him. And guess what? During the experience, he was going... It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. So God is doing great things as we step out on faith to ignite an awakening that impacts Georgia and influences the world through the power of the love of Jesus. So Romans chapter 4, verse 13, we're doing a series on midweek right now called Heirs. And if you missed part 1 and 2, make sure you go to the Faith Plus app or you can see on YouTube and catch up with us. Greeting for everybody watching us online and on Faith Plus. If you're on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, share the link on Faith Plus. Thank you for tuning in. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Romans 4.13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to a seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The New Living Translation says it this way, Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. So one of the things we looked at is we looked at Abraham extensively last week and the week before, that Abraham came before the law. That's why he couldn't be judged by the law because the law wasn't here yet. So how did God deal with Abraham? By promise. God said something. God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham believed it. It was credited to him as righteousness, and God was able to bless him. Now we know when the period of the law came and it ended, and how does God deal with us? By faith, just like he did with Abraham. And so we saw that God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants that the whole world belongs to them. And we studied it out in the first week. Well, when did that happen? Because there's no scripture in the Old Testament that says, Abraham, here's the world. And as we studied it out, we saw that God gave Abraham the world when he blessed him. Because when you go back and look at the history of the blessing in Genesis chapter 1, the first people who were ever blessed was Adam and Eve. The first words mankind ever heard was, be blessed. And when we looked at the implications of what God blessed them for, it impacted the entire world. The second time mankind was blessed was with Noah and his three sons, and that blessing was also to impact the whole world. Then you get down to Abram, who would later be called Abraham, and God blessed him, and the end of the blessing is, in you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. The Hebrew says all the world will be able to bless themselves through you. So once again, the blessing has worldwide impact and so within this statement is, I give you the entire world. And as we study it out, we see in the scripture, in Genesis 26 specifically, it's called the oath that I made to your father Abraham. But Galatians chapter 3, and let's go there again, I'll get back to where I'm going tonight. It's not called the promise, as we see in Romans 4.13. It's not called the oath, as we see it in Genesis 26. But it goes by another name. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, And the Scripture foreseen that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations of be blessed. 
So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And we're of faith, right? So it's called the oath. It's called the promise. It's called the gospel. It's called the blessing. And so within the gospel, and how many of you believe the gospel? All the world belongs to Abraham. And the promise that we saw was not just made to Abraham alone, but all his descendants. And it says, if, you're the, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. You're as much a descendant of Abraham as Isaac is, whether you have Jewish blood or DNA or not. If you belong to Jesus, you are the seed of Abraham, which means the whole world belongs to you. And so as we looked at that, we saw how Abraham and Isaac lived their lives and had this certain manifestation of that promise in their life. And one of the things we realized about Abraham and Isaac, they were not perfect. They had issues, great issues. You better not do some of the stuff that they did. But when God was dealing with them, it wasn't based off of their performance. Because God doesn't deal with you based off of your performance either. What was it? It's based off of faith. They dared to believe God. And they saw that promise manifest in their lives. So let's go back to Romans 8. Say, the whole world belongs to me because I belong to Jesus. And we have to understand if the whole world belongs to us, then we have the responsibility of bringing the gospel to the entire world because it's ours. When you began to think about this, even in your local community, I have a responsibility of praying for my community because it belongs to me. When we talk about ruling and reigning in prayer and using the authority of the name of Jesus in prayer and taking our place seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2, and ruling and reigning using the authority he's given us, of course we have to do it because the world belongs to us. We have to have this thinking that the whole world belongs to me. And as we looked at it last week, we are owners with stewardship responsibilities. So we have to be good stewards with what God has placed in our hands. So Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How many of you are the children of God? If you're born again, you are a child of God. And the Holy Spirit bears witness. That phrase bears witness means gives evidence to. So when you are born again, the Holy Spirit came on the inside of you. He lives on the inside of you. If you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you ain't saved. Because as soon as you're born again, the Holy Spirit himself moved on the inside of you. And one of the things he does on the inside of you is gives you evidence that you are the child of God. That some of you may not even know the right words to how to describe it after you're born again, but you just knew that you knew on the inside, something changed. I belong to God now. He is my Father. You knew that on the inside. But that's not all the Holy Spirit bears witness to or gives evidence to. Yes, he gives evidence that you're the child of God, but let's keep reading to the next scripture. And if children, then heirs. So the Holy Spirit gives evidence to your spirit that you're an heir. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may also be glorified together. Notice you're not a sub-heir of Jesus. That Jesus gets the most and you get what's left. The scripture clearly calls you a joint heir. That whatever Jesus won because of his triumph, whatever Jesus got because God blessed him because of his obedience, Jesus shared with you. And the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you, reminding you, you are a child of God. You are an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing on the inside of you right now. That's why when we began to share these things a couple Sundays ago, faith began to rise in your heart. And we have Minister Dave and sing it out by the Spirit, and the Spirit just took over in a wave of worship. Why? The Holy Spirit was confirming that it all belongs to you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says one of the things the Holy Spirit would do is he will guide you into all truth. Jesus says there's many things I want to say to you right now, but you're not able to hear it. But when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is giving evidence to your spirit. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that loved them. And people are like, oh, that's such a wonderful scripture. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. Isn't that amazing? Keep reading. gets better. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is revealing to your spirit what eye hasn't seen and what ear hasn't heard. What hasn't entered into the heart of man, the Holy Spirit is actively revealing those things to you if you let him. But the problem is so many Christians are so carnal, they won't know the Holy Ghost if he walked in the room with a red hat on. So how can he reveal himself and reveal what he wants to say if people don't listen to him? So the Scripture continues to go. The Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So one of the reasons we've received the Spirit is so that we can know what God has already given us. Not what he'll give us in the sweet by and by. Not something in the future. What God has already done. And one of the things he's already done is give you the entire world. But you only realize that through the work of the Holy Ghost. Which things also we speak. Not in the words with man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So one of the ways he shows you things is through his own words. The Holy Ghost has words. So let's look at some of his words. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, which means divine secrets, plans, and purposes. When you pray in other tongues, you're praying out divine secrets, plans, and purposes. One of the things we talked about last week, that if God has given you the whole world, and he has, there are things right in front of you, you don't even know that they're yours. And you won't even know how to access them unless you receive wisdom from the Holy Ghost. You even don't even know how to take advantage of what he's given to you unless you listen to the Holy Ghost. And when you pray in the Holy Ghost, it keeps going, says you build yourself up. And the thing is, to take what God has already provided for you, you need to build yourself up. You can't do it in your national strength. It's not by might, not by power, but it's by his Spirit. And there are things you have to do in the Spirit that you can't do in the natural. You keep reading 1 Corinthians 2, it says, the things of the Spirit, the things of God are foolishness to the world. So they won't get what we're talking about tonight. They won't get the move of the Holy Ghost. They won't get the Scripture. They'll talk about it and say how wrong it is. But if you stick with the Holy Ghost, you'll get what God has for you. But you must learn to be spiritual people, not fleshly people. You must learn how to hear the voice of the Holy Ghost and follow his leading, follow his guidance. You must learn to be spiritual and not spooky. Because people think if I'm following the Holy Ghost, I'm spooky. No, the Holy Ghost is not spooky. Spooky people make the Holy Ghost seem spooky. But the Holy Ghost is not spooky. He will lead you and guide you. He will talk to you through your spirit. That's why a lot of times when you hear God talk to you, it sounds like you a little bit. Why? He's speaking to you through your spirit. So it's the spirit of God speaking through who you are, and it uses phrases that you're familiar with. Because he's speaking to you through your spirit. But you must learn to be spirit conscious. All of us are body conscious. Some of us are soul conscious. But we must learn to be spirit conscious. No, we do need to do things to build up our body. We should. We do need to do things to build up our mind and work on our emotions. But we also must build up our spirit. We must feed our spirit person. We must pray in the Holy Ghost and build up our inner person. If we even expect to get what God has already given us. Because it's not him holding back stuff from us. 
is us not receiving and taking what he made available. But we must grow up in the things of God if we expect to receive what the Holy Ghost has for us. So Romans 4.13 again, New Living Translation. says, clearly God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Now go to Exodus chapter 6 verse 1. We've looked at Abraham and Isaac. We might get to Jacob and Joseph today. But notice what God says to Moses, referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. Then the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Which in Hebrew, I am Jehovah. I and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, or El Shaddai. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Now, one of the things you have to understand when people read this is first off, they think, okay, Abraham did not know the name of Jehovah. Yes, he did. If you actually said, yeah, Abraham did know that was the name of God. But when you see the word appear, it means I presented myself, I revealed myself, or I caused them to experience. So the names of God, and there's several of them in the Old Testament and the New Testament, express the different character attributes of God. And so he says, in my dealings with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, my main dealings with them were to know me and know the side of my character as God Almighty as El Shaddai. So when Abraham was walking around believing he owned the whole world, he was experiencing God manifest, manifesting himself as El Shaddai. When Isaac stayed in the land of Canaan in a time of famine, when the Philistines started having more than he did, but it began to change and he began to feed that whole countryside and the wells of water began to spring up and he had so much the Philistines became envious of him that they wanted to make a covenant with them. What was Isaac experiencing? God as El Shaddai. They, God said, I cut my covenant with them. How did he cut his covenant with them? As El Shaddai. The covenant keeping God known as El Shaddai. Go to Genesis 17, verse 1. They had a covenant with El Shaddai. And when Abram was 90 year, 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 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So let's define what does that term Almighty God or El Shaddai mean. It means I am God all sufficient. It's from the Hebrew, which means to shed or to pour out. It means I am the God who pours out blessings, who gives them richly, abundantly, and continually. John Wesley said it this way. I am God all sufficient. The God with whom we have to do is self-sufficient. He has everything. He needs not anything. And he is enough to us if we be in covenant with him. We have all in him and we have enough in him, enough to satisfy our most enlarged desires, enough to supply the defect of everything else and to secure us happiness for our immortal souls. All sufficient means sufficient to everything. Infinitely able, sufficient to everything, infinitely able. This name depicts God literally as who is sufficient in granting mercies and who has sufficient power to give whatever is necessary. The title Shaddai really indicates the fullness and riches of God's grace and will remind the Hebrew reader that from God comes every good and perfect gift that he is never weary of pouring forth his mercies on his people, and that he is more ready to give than they are to receive. Bountiful expresses the sense most exactly. The word El sets forth the might of God, and the title Shaddai points to the inexhaustible stores of his bounty. 
This name in Hebrew points the imagery, that paints the imagery of a nursing mother. That as long as the baby makes a demand, there will be a supply of milk. So as long as there's somebody who dares release their faith, that El Shaddai has a supply for them, they will receive a supply. So as long as Abraham dared to believe what God told him, that the whole world belongs to you, that I am your shield, I am your ever-increasing money supply, I have a promise with you, I have a covenant with you, you will have a son. As long as Abraham released his faith, he made a demand on who El Shaddai was, and there was a supply. As long as Isaac decided to believe God and stay in the land of promise, even though it looked like there was a famine all around, he had more than enough because he served the God who was more than enough. As long as they released their faith and who God was, they had a supply because they had a covenant with El Shaddai. He is the one who has a supply. And as long as you make a demand, there will be a supply. El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, the one who has the supply, the all-powerful, all-sufficient God. That's who he is. And so we look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 3 again. He says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Remember, we said not, doesn't mean they didn't know it, but the primary God manifested himself was as El Shaddai. But now he's telling Moses, you're going to know me in my manifestation as Jehovah, the self-existent one who manifests himself. The God who is with you, that's how you're going to know me, that I am with you. And so let's look at this a little bit further. One of the other things you can say about the name Jehovah, now people get tripped up. It's like, oh, how do you say his name? Is it Jehovah? Is it Yahweh? No one knows. Because in the Hebrew, there's no vowels. If you want to be the closest to say it, it's yud Hey vav Hey. But there is another way to say it, but no one knows because they didn't write it down, and no one said it for years because they said the name's too holy, so they forgot how to say it. So don't get tripped up with people on the internet saying, well, you don't know how to say the name of God because nobody does. But God knows what we mean when we say Jehovah or Yahweh, and God's not tripped up just because you don't know how to say something perfect in Hebrew. So don't get tripped up by fake Facebook philosophers. Anywho, this name is described by the commentaries and the sages as the ineffable name, which means the name too great or too extreme to put in words, the self-existent one. That God is so great, that God is so good, is too great and too extreme to put in words. It says the word Jehovah signifies he is. And like the equivalent name, I am, it denotes the self-existence, independence, immutability, and infinite fullness of the divine being. And God is telling Moses, that's how you're going to know me. I'm too great to put in words. I'm the self-existent one who manifests himself. I got you. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even Joseph, knew God as El Shaddai, right? Right? Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt into the wilderness knew God as Jehovah. Go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Say, I'm an heir of God. Say, the whole world belongs to me because I belong to Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Look what Jesus says. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they are full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is and is to come. And the Greek Lord means supreme in authority. But when you look at how they're saying it, you can see the Greek translation, but you can even see what the Hebrew would be. 
what would they call him in heaven right now? Or how did Jesus appear to John? Jehovah El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. I am the self-existent one who's too great to be put in words, who manifests myself as the one who has more than enough, who has more than enough supply for you, who has all the power that you need. That's who your God is, Jehovah El Shaddai. Now go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Who is God? Jehovah El Shaddai. Have faith in Jehovah El Shaddai. Have faith that your God is going to manifest in your life. Have faith that your God is more than enough. Have faith that your God has a supply. Have faith that God has more power than what you need for your situation. Have faith in who he is. Because what happens if you have faith that he is Jehovah El Shaddai, you will have manifestations just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's who he is to you. And you have a covenant with him just like Abraham did. He is a covenant-keeping God. He made a covenant promise of provision for you, a covenant promise of healing for you, a covenant promise for wisdom for you, a covenant promise of salvation. This is who he is. And this book tells you what's yours. You have a covenant with Jehovah El Shaddai. But you have to remember that. Now go to Genesis chapter 37. Actually, before we get to Joseph, let's go to, let's look at Jacob a little bit. Jacob's such an interesting character in the scriptures. So when we get to Yeah, let's look at him when he comes back to Esau. Genesis 32. So one of the things that Jacob is doing now, he fled to the house of his cousin because he tricked Esau out of the blessing. And Esau said, after my daddy dies, I'm going to kill him. So Jacob's mama said, no, no, we can't let you do this. We're going to send you away. And so he's away for 21 years. But what, while he's away, whatever he touches prospers. Why? He's blessed. Now, was he perfect? No. Does he do stuff that you shouldn't do? Uh-huh. Don't you dare do it. But God was with him and blessed him because he had a covenant. Because God said, I'll bless you, Abraham, and your descendants. And Jacob believed it. To even the point Laban had material, but Laban said, I know God has blessed me because you're with me. Appoint me your wages. What do you want to get paid? Now, Laban was a trickster. Jacob was a trickster, but Laban was the OG. And Laban changed Jacob's wages ten times to try to out-trick him, trying to keep some of his money. But the thing is, because Jacob knew his God, Laban's tricks couldn't even work. Because God, Jehovah El Shaddai, told Jacob how to get his herd to produce what he wanted it to produce. And through that, you get to later in chapter 31 that it says, by Jacob. Has he has, he's taken all of our father's glory, all of our father's wealth. So the first time you see the word glory mentioned in Scripture, it's talking about financial wealth. And so when Jacob knows it's time to go, long story short, he leaves, but he knows he's going back to Esau. And the last time he t- heard from Esau, Esau wanted him dead. 
So he's sending, in chapter 32, all these herds ahead of time as a gift to Esau. And what Jacob says to Esau is very interesting. He says, I have more than enough. Why? Now, wait a minute. Jacob was not perfect. No, he had issues. All his wives had issues, which lets you know that was even more issues. <laughs> but God blessed him. One of the things you do see in the life of Jacob is when he does leave faith, he begins to have manifestations just like everyone else. Because he did live a long time. Abraham lived to be 175. Isaac, 180. That makes sense that at least Jacob should do at least 185, right? Now, when he appeared before Pharaoh, he was about somewhere about around 110 or above. And Pharaoh looked at him and said, how old are you? You know you look old if someone got asked how old. And he's told him how old, which is great to live to over 110. That's, that's pretty good. But he said, my years have been few and troubled compared to to my forefathers. I will not reach the years that they did. He understood his life wouldn't be as grand as Abraham and Isaac. He left faith. How do you know he left faith? God had promised 12 sons to Jacob. But when it looked like Joseph was killed, he never sought God. He never asked God about it. The, his sons didn't even say Jacob was killed. They just said, is this the coat of your son? And he began to assume, dangerous, no faith. But we know Joseph, now we can go to chapter 37. We know Joseph wasn't dead. And they, his brothers sold him as a slave. And so he gets down to Egypt. Excuse me, verse, chapter 39. Verse 1, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his sight. And Joseph found grace in his sight and served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hands. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So what happened? What made Joseph a successful person? God was with him. Because when Joseph is bought, he has no material goods. He has nothing. He is the good being bought. But because God was with him, he became a success. Say, because God is with me, I am a successful person. Because Jehovah El Shaddai is with me, I am a successful person. The presence of God made Joseph successful. The presence, the blessing of God made Joseph succeed. And whatever he was placed over prospered. Now remember, we talked about this, I believe, two weeks ago. That the covenant sign, because remember when people cut covenants, sometimes there'll be a slice in their hand or their arm. And there was a scar that signified who they were in covenant with. But the children of Abraham had a different scar. It was through circumcision. It, God picked a place that they would, couldn't show off their scar. Because all the other covenants said, yeah, I'm in covenant with so-and-so. They're like, yeah, we can't show you our scar. And so how would people know who was in covenant with El Shaddai? By what happened on the outside. So when you look at Abraham's life, they knew God was with them. And we looked at Genesis 26 last week, how the Philistines came to Isaac, and we said, we know that the Lord is with you just like he was with Abraham. Why? They saw something. So now you're with Joseph and this Egyptian. 
He doesn't serve the one true God. He serves all of Egyptians' gods. But he knows now there's another God. Why? He saw what happens in Joseph's life. He knew the Lord was with him. And whatever Joseph touched, prospered. So he promoted Joseph, and whatever Joseph was over, prospered. So then he, he was just, he was a smart enough Egyptian to know this. Well, if everything he touched works, you have everything. And it says all the Potiphar knew was what he ate. That's all he knew. Why? He says, why do, if this is working, why do I need to get involved? And whatever Joseph touched prospered and increased. Sounds just like Abraham and Isaac. And we know the story of Joseph, how he's unjustly accused and thrown into prison. But then there's another phrase, but the Lord was with him. And he became a success even in prison. But he didn't stay there, even though he was there for two years and forgotten about, that the Lord brought him out and took him to the palace and made him prime minister over the entire Egyptian empire. Now, we saw before, if Joseph is over it, it prospers. So Egypt prospered because there was a blessed man in charge, because there was a blessed man at the top. He wasn't number one. He was almost number one. But Egypt had no choice but to prosper. So think about this. There are a whole bunch of Egyptians there who don't even know the one true God, but they're enjoying the benefits of prosperity because God put someone there. What made Joseph successful? The presence of God. The presence of El Shaddai. And he had faith in what his God would tell him to do. God gave him a plan. God gave him dreams. And he believed what God said. Joseph did not have a Bible. The only communication or word he had from God was the dreams God gave him. And Joseph believed what God said to him even since he was a teenager. So once again, it's not by Joseph's righteous acts that caused him to be successful. It's because he believed God and the presence of God was with him. And it caused Egypt to prosper. It caused it, we saw it before in another translation, it says Egypt produced bumper crops. That the earth was producing in handfuls. That Joseph was very meticulous about counting everything that came in. But it says eventually gave up because it was too much. Remember how advanced Egypt was in mathematics? You know they had a system for counting high, but you know that's a lot when you can't count no more. And what came in was more than enough for Egypt in the time of famine, because all the other surrounding nations came to them. Where did all that increase come from? The blessed man, the man who walked with God, the man who had the presence of God on his life. The man who was surrounded by the Holy Ghost. And you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And you have him resting upon you. And he is there showing you all the things God has already given you. And it is the presence of God that will make you a success no matter where you are. So then it will behoove you to practice the presence of God. Not be moved because you don't feel a goosebump. Oh, I didn't have a goosebump today. The Holy Ghost ain't here. No, he's here. He said, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So you should have said, well, God be with me as I go. He are, that's a useless prayer. He already said, I'm with you. So God, be with me. He already said, I'm going to be with you. So you said, Father, I thank you that you're with me. Your presence makes me success. Thank you that you're with me in this business meeting. Thank you with me as I go to work. Thank you you're with me wherever I go. Practice the presence of God. Go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. If you practice the presence of God, God will show you what to do. If, you keep, if it's your regular thing, Father, I thank you for being with me. I thank you that you're with me. What are you doing? You're acknowledging him wherever you go. And as you acknowledge him, he'll show you what to do. I was listening to our bishop's message from this previous Sunday, listening to some of the things he began to preach, and the Holy Ghost began to prophesy through him. And he's talked about how the Holy Ghost is going to set up connections for you. 
He's going to send you to people you wouldn't even talk to on a normal basis, people you wouldn't even meet on a random basis, that if you were to think about it, why am I even in this situation? But he says, you don't know the Holy Ghost is setting you up for restoration. That there are things going ahead of you, conversations you're going to have, places you're going to be. You're like, why am I even here? It's because God has restoration for you. One of the things we talked about last year, about the year of abundant harvest, and we began to preach on restoration even last year. The year of abundant harvest has not ended. It's still going. That's the harvest some of you are receiving this year is restoration. It's restitution. Part of the restoration you'll get, you might say, there's no way it could get back to me in that form. That means God doesn't give something to bring to you that is as good or even better quality, and that's still restoration. But you must follow the Holy Ghost to get the restoration because it may not look like what you think it did because you're looking for what happened in the past, and God says, I got something better. But you only see it if you spend time with the Holy Ghost and then you pray in the Holy Ghost and you let the Holy Ghost lead you and guide you and you make a decision not to be offended. Just because the nation is offended doesn't mean you need to be offended. Just because Republicans and Democrats are offended, you don't have to be offended. Just because the president and the Congress and everybody else got something smart to say doesn't mean you got to say it. Think about what you would do by violating the law of forgiveness and stepping out from a place where you hear from the Holy Ghost. Is your restoration really worth your pettiness? Is your restoration really worth you getting in the last word? Is your restoration really worth that tweet or that post you want to put up? We must follow the Holy Ghost. And his path is the path of love. It's a path of faith. It's a path of forgiveness. You have to make a decision that you forgive everybody of everything. Yes, it's an election year. Forgive them in advance. Because you know it's just getting started. Forgive in advance. You're going to watch those debates. Forgive in advance. Next time you watch the debate, just before it starts, Father, I forgive them ahead of time. Then watch. Because unforgiveness will shut down your faith. It doesn't change God's desire to bless you. It just stops your faith from working. And it's your faith is how you receive everything God has provided. Is it really worth shutting down your faith? No. This is a time of restoration, of God bringing things to you. Even if you lost it because you made some dumb mistakes. Even the stuff you lost because of what you did. He says, I will restore to you the years that the cankerworm has eaten. And the cankerworm and the palmer worm, the locusts came because of Israel's foolishness. But God said, you turn to me, I'll give it all back to you plus some. It is by the Holy Ghost we'll do all these things. It's by the Holy Ghost we will succeed because it's the presence of God that makes us successful. Yes, go to school. Yes, get your degrees. I'm not against education. I'm not against studying to show yourself approved. I'm not against all the research you do. I believe in research. I believe in statistics. I believe in all the analysis you can do. I believe in all those things. But those things alone will not make you successful. It's about the presence of God. Because we define success not as what the world does, but completing the will of God for your life. But you need the presence of God. You need to walk in awareness of the presence of God. And know that he is with you, willing to lead you and guide you wherever you go. And you step out and do things, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. You expect divine results because you follow the Holy Ghost. Not because you actually know what you're doing. There's a lot of times you won't. There's a lot of times you'll do stuff going, I have no idea why. I don't even get it. I just know the Holy Ghost said to do it, so I just learned enough to listen to him. And you step out like, well, Holy Ghost, if you don't do something, whew. But then he does it. And I've shared it with this before, that Marietta was nowhere on my radar for right now. (laughs) At all. It was not even the first satellite church I planned to open. And that first one I wasn't planning to open until 2021. But the Holy Ghost began dealing with me. In June, there was actually tongues and interpretation that went forward at our national convention 
Pastor Mark and Pastor Trent Hankins were ministering. I didn't hear a word they said because my little baby was crying. I don't know what the Holy Ghost was saying through them. I was like, I got to listen to it later because Ellie's doing the most right now. And so the next day or two days later, Bishop went over the prophecies. And so I had a copy, so I'm going to read this more on my vacation. But part of it was talking about new assignments, new things the Holy Ghost had for you that he was releasing that week. And then I go and I preach at FX Church in the music hall. And people get saved, people get healed. We had a great time. And then I left there, and every day God kept talking to me about Marietta. And it was, first it was an idea, and after a week or so, I said, maybe I should be spiritual and pray about this. <laughs> maybe I should see if this is God talking to me about it. And I prayed about it. I got confirmation. So like, let me bounce off a few people to make sure it bears witness to their spirit. They said, you're on to something. You're on to something. Then I even get back to the office and look at the statistics. It's like, oh, that's why he's been talking to me about it. So we begin to prepare and step out and do something we hadn't done before. And then we see results like Sunday. And we see people who just come to Jesus just like that. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost just like that. It's the beginning of something wonderful. And as we step out to obey God, we start hearing more things. Like there's a city in another state where they gather on Sunday mornings just to listen to our faith experience. As we step out and follow the Holy Ghost, we see he's already prepared the way. Because, you know, sometimes I got a question, okay, okay, God, I see the vision, but you know that costs, like, a lot of, like, bruh and so what I do I trust him I call it and I thank him for it and he'll bring it in and move upon people's hearts and things begin to happen you know a couple years ago you say well you know in 2020 you guys will have a TV network I'm like well that'll be great possibly I don't know how we do it but it'll be great and now we got one Holy Ghost is up to something. But you must walk with him. You must follow him. You must listen to his voice so you can receive all the things God has already freely provided for you. Because you can't receive it if you don't know it's yours. You can live and die and go to heaven and not know all the things God made available for you on this earth. But don't let that be you. Remember I talked you about in the beginning of January to say that I'm the captain of my inheritance. Things denied to those who came before me, to my ancestors due to ignorance or wicked men is restored to me in my lifetime. You must lay hold to the things the Holy Ghost has for you. But it's by the Holy Ghost because he will tell you things that do not make sense to your mind. So analytical people, he will tell you some things that you cannot have enough equations for. But learn to follow the Holy Ghost. I always remember what my economics teacher, my professor taught us at ORU. He says, I can teach you all the economics, all the Keynesian degrees, everything concerning how the economy works, and teach you all these things about investing. But if you remember one thing from my class, I want you to remember this. The Holy Ghost trumps all. Even if the economy looks like it's going this way, but the Holy Ghost tells you to do something different, you better follow the Holy Ghost. Yes, your research and degrees are needed, but if you have something from the Holy Ghost saying, you better follow me, you better follow him. That's how you'll reap what he has for you. That's how you'll receive the restoration. That's how you're mangaristable, and you're under every Easter and and you'll go to Manda o Sebe, ha ha ha, Manda o Vobo Shala. And that's how you'll go farther. And that's how you'll go with more strength. And that's how you'll go with more energy. And that's how you'll see things you never thought happen manifest in your life. Things you thought were just a far off dream will become a very close reality if you listen to me and follow the directions of my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. So you must follow the Holy Ghost. You must yield to Him. We must be Holy Ghost people. One of the last major words Kenneth Hagin gave before he went home, it was in February 2003. He went home in September of 2003. And one of the words he talked about the next few years, but one of the ways he ended this prophecy, and he says, yes, we have 
said we are a word people, and we are, and that is a good thing. But we must not forget that we are a Holy Ghost people. Yes, we are word people, we are faith people, but we are a Holy Ghost people. We believe in the Holy Ghost. We believe in the moves of the Spirit. We believe in all nine gifts of the Spirit. We believe the Holy Ghost manifests today. We believe the Holy Ghost falls today. We believe the Holy Ghost can do more in five minutes than we can do in five years, so we make room for him. But we must follow him if we expect to receive what God has for us. So you must step out and obey. Step out and obey today. You must do what the Spirit of God tells you to do. Don't say, well, I'll wait till another day. I'll wait till it seems more convenient. You know, when I was looking at starting Faith Plus and, you know, I was doing, going through all the research last year, I said, man, this is going to be a lot more work added to my plate. Maybe I'll wait till another day and do it. And I just had a sense in my spirit, if you do, there'll be blood on your hands. I'm like, ooh, that's not good for me. That's not a good look. There's a lot of looks that ain't good, but that's one look that I don't like. So I step out and obey him. So he may tell you to do something that's going to add some stuff to your plate, but if he tells you to do it, you better do it. And he'll teach you how to manage your time so you can do it all. But you must follow the Holy Ghost. You must do what he tells you to do. He'll get you in places and set you up for stuff you don't even know he set you up for. But you're only going to be there if you follow the Holy Ghost. He'll get you to be the, at the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right things but it's by the leading and the guiding of the Spirit of God who lives on the inside of you, who rests upon you. So you need to spend more time praying in the Holy Ghost. Spend more time making yourself more sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God so that he can do through you what he wants to do through you. He'll show you how to innovate. He'll show you how to mangirdaba. He'll show you how to make the best use of the resources put in your hands. Because we looked at last week, the person who's a good steward receives more. So you become a better steward, you'll receive more. That's one of the principles of the scripture. And there's some things you can be a good steward just using your natural mind and your research. But there's some things you won't know until you consult with the Holy Ghost. So you must listen to him. You must yield to him. You must follow him. Because he can do a work that you thought it would take 20 years and be like that. So one of the things I even knew in my heart, this is the year of the restoration of Faith Christian Center. But it's not going to look like we thought it would 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. It's going to look exactly what the Holy Ghost said it would be. Because I even remember things that Dad Hagen would say about this church, what Mac Timberlake would say about this church. They said, I see it one day. I can see it as a church in the north, a church in the south, a church in the east, a church in the west. I see them as lighthouses in this dark city. It's all coming to pass at last. He has a plan for us as individuals. He has plans for us as families. He has a plan for us as a church family. But it'll only come to pass if we yield to the plan of the Holy Ghost. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Mm, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Nisto Rabaha Kia Namango. Mosura maha vrebo ho kura mangaha ha sutra. That there be an ambro ho shikana maha. That there be a nosta. Adabrosi dishta rama. That you'll do it an amandro sitayanande dishta ha. Oh, mahan de hi stuka hada. Oh, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. Oh, ramandisi talana mango. Oh, Robo Shika Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maha, 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 Dos, Ah, Grossi, Troma, Norenti, Norende, Vitramba, Hongo, Osidra, Ebrahashi, Dora, Maha, 
Dainande Vesida Tondra Bahishi Shushu Shoso. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Andi Yiso Dolobo. Minister Dathan, just sing out Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. That song, real quick. We'll see what else he wants to do before we go. Manga Sutra. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father, a mercy and grace. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit. Speak that out, Sister Gwen. Speak it out. See, it'll be as big and as grand as you release your faith for. It'll be as amazing and as massive and as large as you release your faith for. Because it's not that my hand is too short. It is not that my power is not enough. It's not even that my power has not been made available. 
but as if you release your faith and follow me in the day to day. For my word told you that your prayer, effective and fervent, makes power available. So the power has been made available, but you must take te steps of faith for it to manifest in your everyday life. Yes, it'll manifest in your experiences, but I also want it to manifest in your everyday life. I want it to manifest in your home. I want to manifest in the schools. I want to manifest at the places of work and the places of market. But you must take steps of faith in obeying the leading of my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. And as you do that, you'll see my power here, you'll see my power there, and you'll see my power everywhere. But it's by you following me and yielding yourself to me wherever I go, wherever you go, because wherever I go, because I live on the inside of you, you'll become my hands and feet sure you will and you'll see miracles here and miracles there and miracles everywhere but yield yourselves to me listen on the inside and you receive direction from me love those who seem unlovable love your enemies love those I bring across your way and don't question the people I have you talk to or the places I have you go because just know I've set you up for something good I've set you up for some restoration I've set you up for things you thought that you could not or should not get but I decided you get it because I love you I decided I give that company to you because I love you I decided I give that land to you because I love you not because you did something right but because my son did something right and because I love you I hand it over to you so stop thinking about your righteousness I told you in the scriptures as filthy rags think about the righteousness of my son for I've made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus have faith in who I said you are have faith in who I said I am and you'll see tremendous things happen this year yes it'll be transformation yes it'll be restoration but it'll be more marvelous than you ever thought more wonderful than you've ever imagined dear more wonderful more awesome more grand than he ever thought possible and you'll know it and the world will know it and they'll say it's because their God loves them hallelujah glory to God 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 man God thank you Holy Ghost for tongues and interpretation of tongues. Da predisto. She clicks to Mahanda. Mango no said that. Numerize and you got anything? Erama. Shusaka. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Rosia ha. Vera nunga hang Krishna. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Mm, see that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. be something up tempo. Minister Dathan sing out, follow the Holy Ghost. Follow the Holy Ghost. Hey Chuck, remember those old Rama drinking songs? Not one specifically, but you remember that field, that camp meeting. Where we just be in the presence of God and the Holy Ghost get to move. It's funny, I was never there. <laughs> Put your hands together.
of God. Hallelujah. We're going to sing it again, so don't go anywhere. We're going to sing it again. Let's receive tonight's offering before we go home. If you need an offering, I would love to assist with your giving. You can lift your hands so us, your hosts will be glad to serve you with one. If you need an offering, I would love to assist with your giving. You can lift your hands so us, your hosts will be glad to serve you with one. If you're watching online or via Faith Plus, you just want to give online, you can go to FCCGA.com. If you're watching online or Faith Plus or you want to get in here, just want to give via text, you can text FCCGA to 73256. FCCGA to 73256. You can give via check, just make it payable to Faith Christian Center. If you want to give via credit card or debit card, just sign the appropriate portion on the envelope, put the amount in the box above, as well as give you a telephone number just in case we need to reach you. Of course, all gifts of faith are tax deductible. Follow the Holy Ghost in your giving. Whatever he tells you to give, let him lead you, let him guide you. You'll see the spot online or via text in the envelope for tithes and offering. You'll see spots for giving above and beyond your tithes and offering the different designations. As we do what God has called us to do to enhance this building and extend our outreach and missions, as well as expand to Marietta and other locations, follow the Holy Ghost as he leads you. Now, we talked about, you know, how we're on that sign. Anyone see a billboard already? And so I told you last week, someone came up to me and said, Pastor, what about the second month? Then on Sunday, someone came up to me and said, Pastor, what about that third month? Praise. Thanks for watching today. We hope today's message was a blessing to you that it empowered you to make Jesus famous in every area of your life. Hey, if you want to be a part of what God's doing here at Faith, you know, our vision statement is to ignite an awakening that impacts Georgia and influences the world through the power of the love of Jesus. And we'd love for you to be a part. You can find out our different experience times and our different locations by going to FCCGA.com. If you want to give, you can text FCCGA to 73256. You can also go to FCCGA.com to give online and be a part of what God's doing here. We'd love to see you anytime you're in our area. We believe God has something good just for you. And anytime you come to our faith experience, we believe if you will experience God and his plan for your life. So thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.